Corinthians 11, and may your Holy Spirit move among us here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it calmly that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. You may be seated. Good morning. So good to be in the house of God this morning. Um, yeah, it's just good to be with us, with you, and hear the singing this morning, be a part of the singing, and the devotion, the Sunday school lesson, and the topic. Um, yeah, it's just great to be in the house of God. This morning, I chose to um, have a sermon on the war on morality, the headship order, and the head covering. Um, you may wonder why such a topic. I think I may have preached on the headship covering five, six years ago. I've been asked um, by people, or I've heard people have said, you know, this is something we don't preach on very often, so maybe I'm going to be a little redundant and say some of the things I said the last time. It is a hard topic. Um, in many ways, and it's studied, 1 Corinthians 11 is studied in, by many theologians, and there's a lot, of, there's a lot out there um, on this topic. Um, many, many theologians spend hours and hours on 1 Corinthians 11 trying to understand what it's about. And I don't claim to be able to give you a clear, perfect picture and definitely just scratch the surface on the three topics of morality, headship, and the head covering this morning. Love to hear more from you. Dig in God's Word. There's a lot there um, on this topic. So after the sermon, continue to study um, what God has on this for us as a church and for maybe us as individuals. I'm going to open up with a verse um, in Ephesians. For though we, I'm sorry, in first, uh, Second Corinthians. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of the strongholds. You've been spending any time in the news the last three, four months. May have been a little discouraged. Um, there's a lot in there about rioting in the streets. Supreme Court continuing to take away rights of employers given to the LBGTQ crowd, churches taking away their rights to worship and sing together as a group, abortion clinics opening during the pandemic and transgender operations taking place while restricting cancer treatment, um, and the list goes on of just things that we say morality and breakdown of morality in our nation. And we say, what's going on? We're engaged in a battle, brothers and sisters, um, and it's real. And there are many um, who are standing strong, but there are many in the church who are falling in this battle um, and refusing to fight. 
We cannot fight that war in human strength or wisdom. But like Paul says in verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or human, but we are fighting with weapons that are mighty in God. In other words, we have supernatural weapons. That's good to know, isn't it? In a time like this, we have supernatural weapons um, that help us in this battle. Let's remember who and what we're fighting and how we need to engage in this battle. John MacArthur says this, It's a spiritual and a supernatural battle of ideologies, ideologies that men have concocted under the influences of demons. Fortresses are being built out of these ideologies. They are solid in their foundation. They are rooted in the world and in the culture of the world. And we have to go after them with supernatural weaponry. This is a tremendous task for us as Christians. Um, And I think that's not a surprise to us. Hopefully it's not. I believe Satan throughout history has been at war against morality. This battle is not a new battle. And probably not any more intense than it was a thousand years ago, even though it seems like it is to us. Satan has battled the headship order for years, knowing it can bring people to questioning the headship headship order and their authority. He has won the war. If he does that, he can win the war on morality. This is also why the devil hates the head covering, because the head covering shows Satan and the angels your belief on the headship order, which we're going to talk about some more. This morning, I'd like to cover these three very important topics, morality, headship order, and the head covering. And we're going to start with the first battle, the war on morality. War on morality or truth started in the garden when Satan questioned God's truth and has continued today. Satan said, is it really so? Um, The war on morality is is more of a war uh, against truth than anything else. This is also why Satan hates... I'm sorry. Um, In fact, before we finish the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we read about every type of immoral behavior and Satan's battle to pervert all mankind. Now listen to this. This is Genesis. I'm just going to go over this real quickly. In Genesis 4, verse 23, we have the first polygamy. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 22, we have the first lustful look stated. In chapter 16, verses 1 to 3, we have the first case of idolatry. In chapter 19, we have the entrance of homosexuality with all its perverseness. In chapter 34, verses 1 and 2, fornication is introduced. In chapter 38, the first case of incest is written. In chapter 38, verse 24, the first prostitution. And in chapter 39, the first specific incident is recorded of seduction. So before we get out of Genesis... We see every type of immorality um, that we're dealing with today in our culture. People are bombarded with perversion, all designed by Satan through the world system. If you look back at our nation's history, around 1920, if you like history, you would say this was was called the um, Roaring Twenties. Some things happened. Um, And if you want to... Well, maybe I'll, I'll go on with that a little bit. Um, this is a time of great weight, wealth and a great change in the culture in our country. It's also a time when the morals of our country started to break down. The feminist movement brought an end to the head covering in society. That's when, before this, most women in society, whether church going or not, wore the headship covering. The Roaring Twenties, the feminist movement, was the beginning of the end for the the head covering for many people in society. Now, we're not even talking churches. Later on, churches gave that up also. The feminist movement brought an end to the head covering in society, eventually also in many churches. The feminist movement also was the beginning of many other moral battles like divorce and remarriage. Um, And then in 1973, Roe v. Wade and the legalizing of abortion, and more recently, the legalizing of same-sex marriage. These battles were lost in society and then quickly lost in many churches. You see, these battles do not only, these battles are not only moral battles, but they're satanic battles going on in our society. Satan will always battle not only in society, but in our church's morality. The scariest thing about the feminist movement is its desire to destroy God. And this is when I started studying and 
um, understanding the feminist movement, which was, the, which was the beginning of the end for a lot of head covering. Um, it was not just about getting, eliminating the head covering. The feminist movement is about eliminating God. And you see that um, in society. The scariest thing about the feminist movement is it's these already true God. Listen to the quotes of some leading feminists of today or of, of recent past. Gloria Stenman, editor of Ms. Ms. Magazine, quote, By the year 2000, we will hope to raise our children to believe in human potential and not God. Another radical feminist, Sheila Koran, says this, Since marriage constitutes slavery for women, it is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution. Freedom for women cannot be won without the abolition of marriage. All of history must be rewritten in terms of oppression of women. We must go back to the ancient female religion like witchcraft. She's a very well-known radical feminist of today. Margaret Sanger, founder of, parent, plan, founder of Planned Parenthood or abortion, said this, the most merciful thing a large family can do to one of its infants is kill it. Now that's the feminist movement. Um, and that's the movement that started the end for the headship covering. You may be thinking, what is happening to my world? But I'd like to remind you of this. The battle Satan has long raged in our world. Its origins came very early after the fall. Feminism is a very old heresy. Um, in fact, feminism started way back in the early, probably in the garden, you could probably say. But it was started in the name of Gnosticism, which I'm going to just read a little bit about, and then we're going to move on. Feminism is an ancient form of paganism. In fact, the very same one that Paul faced in the first century AD when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church. The ideologies of this time wasn't, weren't any different than what we're facing today. In fact, the best way to understand is that it is a repackaging of what we know of today as the New Age movement. It was called Gnosticism. Gnosticism from the Greek word Gnostis, or to know. In ancient times, there was always people who said they were, had higher knowledge. They had ascended beyond the frivolous, trivial, low-level thinking of most people, particularly Christians. Even today, like in the time of Paul, we're getting assaulted by those who have the higher knowledge. Brothers and sisters... That is a scary word. When people try to come to a, a Christian and say, I know way better than you. I have a higher knowledge. That's old heresy. That's not new. And the devil will constantly work on um, us as Christians by making us believe we're not smart. We don't know anything and we're simple. We call this thinking today the New Age religion. The parallels of Gnosticism, New Age, reli new age, religion, new age religion is starkingly similar. You see, the devil's at war against truth and God's word. If he can get us to believe this headship order and the head covering doesn't matter anymore, he has us where he wants us. Let's take a closer look at the headship order Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, and if you look at verse... I hope you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 11. Um, we're just going to... Look at some verses in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. I'm not going to go into many details um, this morning about 1 Corinthians 11, but there's a verse there on uh, verse 4 talks about headship. Every man, I'm sorry, verse 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Here's the headship order that we hear about and Paul talks about. Um, it's the authority structure um, that Paul is talking about here. I'm just going to make a couple points about that, and then I want to talk about the, the three different headship orders. It's not hard to see we're living in a generation that hates headship. Is that right? Read the news. Everybody's, um, we have rioters against authority. We have many people fighting many things. People don't want someone to tell them what to do. We all want to be our own authority, and we wonder why our world is turned upside down. And, bef <clears throat> and before we point fingers at Antifa or BLM, let's take a look at our own lives. What headship order are we fighting? What's the battle that Satan is trying to get us to, to fight? What authority are we fighting? 
Dr. K.P. Kohan, and pastor of the Metropolitan Believers Church in India, in his book, Headship Covering, says this, Paul wanted the believers at Corinth to grasp the depth of his teaching, the headship order, the foundation from which all of God's acts originate. This foundation, the authority, the government of, of God, flows from the throne of God and is basic for the teaching and practice of of the headship order or the head covering. In 1 Corinthians 11, 3, the headship order is God's government and his order of authority. In many ways, the headship order doesn't always make human reasonable sense. You start studying this a little closer and you're like, it doesn't quite logically make sense. And that's where the feminists, that's where the world goes. Does it make sense for men to have, uh, for women to have to be submissive, uh, submissive to men? Um, a lot of, in a lot of ways, you could Soon have yourself believing that just doesn't make sense. Um, and it doesn't have to. It's what God has asked us to believe in and do. And that's why the world rebels against this. But as Christians, we want to stay under God's umbrella of protection. We need to believe it is God's way and his government and, his government and follow his headship. Another interesting quote I found by Watchman Nee um, a well-known Baptist Chinese pastor said this about the headship and the headship covering. The matter of head covering belongs to God's government. For those who do not know God's government, it's impossible to exhort them to have their heads covered. They will not be able to understand how much is involved in this matter. So what is the headship order? And let's go right to 1 Corinthians 11, 3. And let's look at the first of the headship order. First of all, God is the head of Christ. We see Christ as equal to the Father, yet submitting to the Father as his leader, and may I say his authority. Now this is kind of hard for us to understand, right? God and Jesus are equal. Is that right? Yeah. But Christ submitted to God's authority. So I think it's very easy to understand that that's kind of a picture of marriage or men and what uh, a man and a woman we'll talk about that some more when paul brought this concept to the church it was a radical change for how the jews treated women uh, let me let me let's think about it this way in today's society the idea of women submitting to men is is hard for us it's hard for anybody to to accept or comprehend back then in the jewish culture in the culture of the day women were treated very Second, um, they were not equal to men in any ways. And that's changed dramatically since Christ came and brought the idea of submission and headship and saying men and women are equal. They're not. One's not higher than the other. So in, in some ways, this idea of headship was an idea of women being equal now to men, just like Jesus is equal to God. Think about it this way. What if Jesus wouldn't have submitted to his father? That is exactly what Satan was tempting Jesus to do when he took him to the high mountain to tempt him. He was hoping he would convince him to be his own authority. Listen to this. Um, here's, here's Matthew 4, 8 to 10. The devil took Jesus to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Get thee behind thee, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Basically, that battle right there was a battle of, Will Jesus submit to his father? And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. I don't want to hear of it. I will submit to my father. Let's look at more verses in the Bible showing Jesus' submission to the father. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. That was Jesus, speak, that was Paul, wrote that. Jesus speaking of his submission to his Father. So this thing of submission starts with Jesus' submission to the Father as a wonderful example of what submission should be all about. And if Jesus wouldn't have submitted to his Father, where would we be? We wouldn't have redemption. We wouldn't be here this morning. There'd be no point to come into church. Um, 
Christ set the example for all of us how to submit to our head. And because of his example in submitting to his Father and willingly dying on the cross for us, we have salvation and redemption. That leads us to the next headship order. Christ is head of man. The next headship order. Too often the problem starts here. I think the problems in our society are probably not feminist women problems, but probably men problems. Men not submitting to the Father, or men not sub submitting to Christ. Are we men willing to submit to our authority? We say, are we willing to submit to Christ? But how does that look? Let's look at a few practical ways. I'm just going to go into some practical ways for us as men here, um, since a sermon is not just for women. Let's look at practical ways we can submit to our head, Christ. How are we doing as leaders of our home, leaders in our youth group? Are we stepping up to the plate showing true godly leadership? Are we the spiritual leaders in our community or are we expecting the ladies to lead out? That's part of submission to the Father, our, our submission to Christ. Christ asks us to stand up as leaders, men. If we don't do that, we're not submitting. How are we doing with authorities? Are we leading out in the way we respect authorities? COVID-19 was a stretch for us, right, in many ways. And I'm not going to get into the details of what's right and what's wrong as far as submitting to our authorities. Um, I will say, I was just sitting in a lunchroom Friday and by a very conservative group of people, you would have had a hard time believing they were conservative when it came to their opinions on how to submit to authority. Quite eye-opening. Um, and I'm not one to get controversial with this subject, but yeah, when they can very loudly say, I will never listen to my authority when it comes to this. It's a little bit of a problem. And I think we have to constantly take a look at our own hearts um, with things. Our township, how are we doing? Tough one. How about... Our wicked government quote that we like to say. How do we do with just the way we speak about? Just the way, what's our attitude towards our government? And they are authority, okay? Again, I'm just pointing out how are we doing submitting to Christ? And you say, what's that have to do with our wicked government authority? I think a lot. We set the example on how we submit. Christ asks us to submit to our government. How are we doing? Um, another question, are we following Christ's example as a servant? Remember, leaders should be, what, the greatest servants? How are we doing, men? Are we serving um, people around us, our family, our wives, um, people around us? What are we doing to show an example to women of what we think of Satan's kingdom? Here's a tough one. Are we willing to stand up against the tithe? That's what a leader is, right? A man that's willing to stand up against the tithe. I've heard of... Um, I heard it said one day, a leader is, or it wasn't a leader, it was a, um, the definition of um, a leader is somebody who's walking upstream against the tide. Are we doing that with the tide of the world um, coming in against us? Are you willing to stand up against the tide of the part of, <clears throat> and not be a part of the kingdom of the world in our lifestyle, in our words, in our entertainment, in our music, um, and many, many other things? Are we men, the leaders, and standing up um, in the world we live in. Do we expect our women to dress modestly, wear a head covering, and submit to their head when we can't do it ourselves? I don't think it's too hard for us to see the perversion and the immorality of the world and Satan's kingdom, but are we able to stand up against it? Men, very important question for us. A part of submitting to our head, Jesus Christ. One more question I need to ask, and that's in verse 4. I'm not going to spend much time in verse 4. Don't grin and smile when you read this, but this is a hard one. Okay, It's easy to talk about the headship covering because we as Mennonites have chosen to follow this. Verse 4 says this, and I'll, I'll say this. Paul was saying two things here in 1 Corinthians 11. One was, we as Christians, see the, Jewish, the Jews today still come to church. How? with the Jewish men and women, by the way, come to church or their synagogues with their head covered. Okay? We all have seen Jews with their head covered, especially always in worship, for sure. Do we do that? No. Paul said, when Christ came, we can go before the Father with our head uncovered. 
Or we say we can't. We should go before the Father with our head uncovered. We should go to worship with our head uncovered. We as men today. I guess the question that I need to ask, let's just read the verse, sir. Um, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So think about that, men. When do we wear hats? Or do we wear them too much? Um, Another maybe just a um, thought on headship here. Um, I'll let you work through that. I know no, it doesn't seem fair. Maybe we should be working through that for the rest of the day um, instead of talking about the headship for women. But that is a topic in itself and should be thought through, we as men, um, on wearing hats. Um, next one. Next headship order. The head of women, a woman. And yes, this is why God is asking women to wear the covering, to show her willingness to follow her head. I'd like to point out three things about this headship. First thing I believe is important to point out here for all of us is that the matter of woman's subjection to men, man's leadership, and the head covering is this. It is not about us. The headship order and the covering covering transcends the physical realm and represents something much deeper than we can see here on earth. There's much more to the headship order than what we see. There's much more to a woman wearing a covering than what we see. And I'm not going to have time to spend on that, but that is, um, a lot could be said on this. It's also not about inferiority. Second point, women are equal in value to men. Make it very clear. It's not hard for me to understand that being married. My wife is as important as I am, and probably much more in a lot of ways, and our home for sure. Um, women are equal to men. And I think the picture of Christ and Jesus just makes that so clear. I mean, God and Jesus. Jesus submitted to God, and yet Jesus is as equal to God. And so the same um, for women and men. The headship principle has nothing to do with inferiority, whether academically, spiritually, morally, socially, or anything else. But God is the one who ordained it. This is his authority structure, not a man-made thing. Okay, so very clear. Women are equal to men um, in many ways. It was established in the garden before the fall as a creation principle. And who are we to rebel against it? If we, if we are, we are literally rebelling against God and his creation principle. We shouldn't be surprised if our country is in turmoil if we work so hard to rebel against this principle. And I have to say, I shouldn't be surprised if our churches are in turmoil if we've been working so hard to rebel against the principle of headship and the head covering. And I think it's one reason you find lukewarmness so much in many churches um, because, of the, this re- because of rebellion against some of these principles. It's a principle clearly demonstrated in the Trinity. All three are equal, and yet to keep order, there must be a headship and, a, and sub subordination. The Son willingly submits himself to the will of the Father and the Holy Spirit doing the work of the Son. You as a woman, you as a woman have the opportunity to show the world how Jesus so, showed subjection to, to his Father. We just, co- <clears throat> we just covered the second battle Satan has been waging, the, wage, the battle against the headship principle. Let's now look at the head covering, the third battle that I think Satan is waging against, and that's the battle of the head covering. I want to make maybe just a disclaimer here, or I don't know if that's called a disclaimer. Um, In doing this, I am not encouraging, in studying this or talking about this, I am not encouraging self-righteousness as believers. We are better than, we're not better than others if we obey this command. That's not the point. And if it brings self-righteousness to us, shame on us. A beautiful thing that God is asking to do can be destroyed by many things like self-righteousness. Neither am I encouraging you women to wear the head covering for legalistic reasons. But what I'd like to encourage you is to follow God's command because we love him. We want to glorify him because of what he did for us. The covering is not a salvation issue, but a great benefit and a blessing for us as a church to follow. The head covering. Why is it for today? I believe, first of all, and probably the most important reason to wear the head covering is the Bible commands it. Okay? I'll say this about 1 Corinthians 11. I think most middle school students could read 1 Corinthians 11 and say, it's a head covering. Not so complicated. God asks, us to wear a, uh, God asks women to wear a head covering. 
In fact, a lot of theologians study this passage, and I've read many commentaries, and most of them say, guess what? Yes, it is a head covering. Some of them will find, say, it's culture and use all kinds of reasons why we don't need to wear it. But most theologians go back and say, yeah, that's what it is. Not so complicated. Men like R.C. Sproul, who said this, if anything transcends local custom, it is those that are rooted and ordained at creation. That is why I'm very frightened to loosen of this passage. He's talking about 1 Corinthians 11. You'll also be surprised to hear many evangelical pastors like John Piper, John MacArthur, Watchman Nee, K.P. K. P. Johanan, and, and many others that you start reading, they agree that this is actually the head covering. So why do they not promote it, or why do they not, why do they not wear it in their churches? Because it's too hard. They can't change it now. The culture has made it too hard for them to change. Is that a good reason? Probably not. But we have it here. Why would we let go of it? It's also interesting to note that there are many believers throughout the world who still wear the head covering. In India, Romania, Russia, China, Haiti, and the list go on, there's many women wearing head coverings. Um, we as Mennonites are not alone in wearing the head covering, by the way. Um, another interesting note is there's a movement in, within America right now called the head covering movement. It's not, Mennonites have nothing to do with it. Um, but a lot of women starting to wear the head covering as they study scripture. One other thing I found very interesting and don't have much time to cover is the head covering had been worn since, I believe, creation. Now, this is very interesting. Um, I can't prove it for fact. Um, the Jewish women in the Bible always had their head covered. In fact, the Orthodox Jews still do that today. A lot of them shave their head and wear wigs. That's what they call their head covering. In fact, if you were a Jewish man and your wife did not, was caught in public not wearing a head covering, you were allowed to divorce her. So head covering was something that's not new. But even more important to note than that is why the early church did, or what the early church did. There actually is much written in the early church about the headship covering, so much. If you want to study it, you can find it. And interesting part, if you want to study it, just pull up Wikipedia. And they have pages and pages, I should say pages, lots of stuff on the early church and their belief on the headship and quotes um, from men in the early church. Tertullian, Augustine, Jer um, Jerome, Origin of, Origin of Alexandria, and the list goes on. You'll also find many much read and said about the headship movement by the evangelical forefathers like Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, John Knox, um, all wrote about the headship covering. Here's an interesting quote by John Calvin, kind of prophetic, and I'm not going to read the whole quote, but I'll just read some of it. I think I may have read this earlier. So if women are thus permitted to have their heads uncovered and show their hair, they will come to make this an exhibition as if it were a tavern show. They will become so brazen that modesty and shame will be no more. In short, they will forget the duty of the nature. So when it is permissible for women to uncover their head, one will say, well, what harm is it in uncovering? And he goes on and on about that. That's John Calvin. And many evangelicals will say that's our forefather that we study, believe in. Unfortunately, don't always follow I don't believe many will argue too long whether this is a biblical command, but because of the culture around us, we just don't feel it is necessary to do it anymore. I believe that's a sorry reason to not follow God's command. If giving up God's command becomes culture around us, because the culture around us has given up on this, we shouldn't wonder why so many churches have accepted so many other things spoken against in the Bible, like blatant immodesty, divorce and remarriage, women preachers, and yes, now homosexuality. Has there ever been a time when it feels like people are willing to ignore the commandments in the Bible without much regard? I don't believe many of us find it hard to understand when we start ignoring one of God's commands. It's so easy to quickly to ignore more and more and more. Is there no other reason, if for no other reason, we should believe and practice the headship prevailing because it says it in the Bible? Second point I have, the head covering is beyond the visible. First of all, 
We are clearly giving a visible sign to those around us when wearing the head covering. It's an ordinance that gives a visual symbol for a spiritual truth, like communion service or baptism, or kind of like a wedding service. So we have wedding services for everybody to see it, to give a point, give a visible, uh, visible, make a visible point of um, a truth. And that's what a covering does too. It's also important to note, not only are people around you seeing the physical covering, but is recognized and seen by the unseen world. God's angels and Satan's demons. When a woman covers her head, she covers both her glory and man's glory, allowing all glory to be to God. When angels come before God's throne, they use their wings to cover themselves. In fact, two-thirds of, their, uh, of an angel's body, I don't know I've read this, is, is to cover itself. Their wings, or two-thirds of the body are their wings, and they use that to cover themselves when they come before the Father. When angels come before the throne, they use their wings to cover they understand the holiness of God and believe it grieves them when they see a woman covering, coming before the Lord with their head uncovered. Listen to this. This is an, an early church father, St. John Christensen. An early church father says this, If the air is filled with angels, how much more the church? Hear the apostles teaching this when he bids the woman to cover their heads with a veil because of the presence of angels. In Satan's first act of rebellion, he sought to project himself in his own glory, like, he said, like it says in Isaiah 14, 13. I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars. Some people believe in his first act of rebellion, he came before the Father uncovered. Now, I'm not just talking about his head uncovered, but his feet. And, and that was angels always come before the Father covered. Like Watchman Nee says, no wonder Satan persistently opposes the matter of the head covering. It really puts him to shame. We are doing what he has failed to do. Got that, ladies, men? We're doing what he has failed to do when we wear the head covering. We may have wondered what Paul has meant in verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. I think it has something to do with this. Not only does the head covering affect the angels... But the rebellion un of the uncovered head affect the fallen angels and give them power and give them power and control in our world. I believe this rebellion has a direct effect on the problems of our country and our churches. Brings us to, that brings me to the third point. The unveiling of the head covering in our society and churches has a direct effect on morality and rebellion in our country. I don't have a lot of time to spend on this. There could be much said on this. The feminist movement of the 20s was the beginning of a downward spiral of morality in our country. One of the first things that changed in our churches in this movement was the head covering. But we all know Satan wasn't satisfied there. It's not hard to understand what else he did. Many, many things. This led to immodesty, divorce and remarriage, women preachers, and the list goes on. Are we at all surprised that if the churches have changed so much in the last hundred years that our society in general has also taken up the same rebellion as continues to perpetuate, perpetuate rebellion and sin to an even greater level? I think it's very clear for us here at Weavertown. If we expect not to follow the rebellion of the world, we need to humbly submit to, yes, the headship order, the head covering. And I know that's a hard one. Um, I know that's not easy, and I know the devil is determined to not make it easy. And I think that's one proof of the value of the head covering is how much the devil is trying to do to destroy that. Last reason I believe for wearing the head covering is there is a blessing in wearing the head covering. Um, unfortunately, I don't have much time to talk about that, but there is a wonderful blessing in this, and I just want to give a couple points in this blessing. When we truly submit and follow Christ, it will even change our demeanor. That's the first point I have. People that are submissive, men or women, and follow Christ, have a radiant spirit about them, especially if they're doing it with a good attitude. Now, it can be done sometimes in a bad attitude, um, we submit just because we have to. I've seen little children that way, and I've seen big children that way, big boys and big girls that way too. But I think it's kind of like the verse in, um, uh, forget where it talks about the cheerful giver. He says, don't do it grudgingly um, for us today. Don't submit grudgingly. Do it cheerfully. And if you do, it's going to affect your countenance. People around you are going to be uh, moved by your spirit. Another way I do believe the head covering can be a blessing to a woman that wears it, it can be a protection. And again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about protection, but there is so much to this. Um, I believe there is a wonderful spiritual protection for all who put themselves under authority. 
You find so many places in the Bible where someone rebelled and stepped out of the authority and the consequences. And people like David who followed their authority and actually the consequences of following authority. I also believe there's a physical protection for women who wear the head covering, and I'm not going to get into that. Another blessing I think we often may forget is the wonderful witness you have as women in wearing a head covering. And as I was studying this, I realized that men are supposed to uncover when they become before the Lord ever since redemption. So why weren't women? And I um, struggled with that for a while. And I'm going to just talk about that maybe a little bit here. The head covering is a wonderful witness of our love and desire to follow Christ and follow the headship order. I believe when a woman wears a covering, she's pointing back to Christ's redemption story in the gospel message. You see, in the Old Testament, men were required to wear a hat before they went into worship. But after Christ came and died, men were asked to remove their covering because we can freely come before the Father and worship him, now uncovered as men. Jesus took away our guilt and allowed us to come before the Father uncovered. You may be thinking, just like I was, why then should women come before the Father veiled? I struggled with this one. Did they not receive this, his righteousness? Absolutely they did. Of course we know women did receive the same righteousness that we received because of Christ. Just like Christ did when he submitted himself. <clears throat> they did this. This is a symbol of a woman following her head just like Christ did when he submitted to the cross. So in essence, when you're wearing the covering, you are boldly saying, I am willing to humbly humble myself and submit to my head the same way, and here's where the witness is, here's where the blessing is, that Jesus Christ did for his father. In Mark 14, 36, Jesus says, And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you to remove this cup from me, yet not... What I will, but you will. You are a testimony to all who see you wearing the, covering of, wearing the covering of Christ's submission to his Father and of our redemption because of what Christ did on the cross. So in essence, when you're wearing the covering, you're showing everyone the gospel story. Um, you're, giving, you're a witness of what Christ did in submitting himself to his Father. And because of that, we can have salvation. Women, your covering, your covering when you wear it is a symbol and a testimony of the gospel message. In conclusion, I'd like to say, I've only scratched the surface, and I think you probably caught that pretty easily. I'm sure I missed a lot. Um, but we as Christians are so blessed to have our loving king set an example of headship to us. His commands are never grievous, but a blessing. After all, wouldn't the creator of the universe create a perfect structure for his children to follow? I'm asking that as a question. Wouldn't he do that? I think we know that answer. His commands are not only ones that work, but they're also ones that ultimately bring glory and honor to him. They are what cures the problems of our sin in our cursed world. When we understand and practice our king's headship principle, it will be a blessing to our church and our community we live in and will change the world around us. It's a principle that works, and it's worth following for our generations and for generations to come. I'd like to close with 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Blessings to all of you um, as we seek to follow God's command. Let's kneel together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your many, many good things you've given us. And thank you for having a perfect way. Um, help us to seek out that way. Help us not to be self-righteous as we seek out your way. Um, thank you for what you've taught us in your word and the blessings in your word. And that we can go back to the, your word in times when it feels like the world's falling apart. Help us, God, to be a light um, in the world around us. And be willing to do that um, with a good spirit, not grudgingly, but do it in a way that um, we bring honor to you. Just help us as a church to be able to um, seek you and follow you, um, especially in this headship order and the headship covering. Um, help us to um, look to you as, as the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for Jesus, and thank you for the group here. Just pray for, as we go out um, and go about our week, help us to be a light and help